Alhamdulillah, he was a fellow solar to a salamara, Sulila, while I early he was a fee is married. Am I bad? I would be laying him in a shaitan regime. Bismillah, he Rahman, he Rahim. In Fatahna, like a fatham mubina. ليغفر لك الله ما تقدم دم من ذنبك وما تأخر ويتم نعمته عليك ويهديك سراط مستقيما وينصرك الله نصرا عزيزا هو الذي أنزل السكينة في قلوب المؤمنين ليزدادوا إيمانا مع إيمانهم ولله جنود السماوات والأرض وكان الله عليما حكيما ليدخل المؤمنين والمؤمنات جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار خالدين فيها ويكفر عنهم سيئاتهم وكان ذلك عند الله فوزا عظيما ويعذب المنافقين والمنافقات والمشركين والمشركات الضانين بالله ظن السوء عليهم دائرة السوء وغضب الله عليهم ولعنهم وأعد لهم جهنم وساءت مصيرا ولله جنود السماوات والأرض وكان الله عزيزا حكيما إنا أرسلناك شاهدا ومبشرا ونذيرا لتؤمنوا بالله ورسوله وتعزروه وتوقروه وتسبحوه بكرة وأصيلا إن الذين يبايعونك إنما يبايعون الله يد الله فوق أيديهم فمن نكث فإنما ينكث على نفسه ومن أوفى بما عاهد عليه الله فسيؤتيه أجرا عظيما صدق الله العظيم الحمد لله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله All praises for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most gracious the most merciful and for infinite amount of blessings and peace be upon the noble prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and upon his companions and all those who are upon the straight path 
Alhamdulillah, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us a beautiful Ramadan and Eid and finally to come back. This is the first uh, lesson after Ramadan. We have stopped before Ramadan. Mm-hmm. We're starting Surah Fatih today. This is the 48th Surah. So we're very thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Indeed, when you study some knowledge, it has a lot of high rank. It has a lot of reward, equivalent to lots of years of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And spending some time in, learning some ilm about the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some ilm, some ilm, some sacred knowledge is superior to years of worship. <clears throat> so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant those rewards and those ranks to us. Today's surah, we're starting Surah Al-Fatih. This is a Madani surah. And we've read the 10 verses with you. This is a Madani surah. And the word Fatih means victory. So this surah means the victory. Um, there's a... There's a big context to this, a famous context, Sulah Hudaybiyah, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. So we're going to have to mention that because this surah it makes mention of that. It's primarily is for that. It's for that treaty. The little parts of that treaty or that event of that treaty is mentioned throughout the surah, along with mentioning Sahaba Ikram, their fadila, how virtuous Sahaba Ikram, how steadfast they were in whatever the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam you know, wanted for them. They always went forward. And it talks about also Munafiqeen. Munafiqin, how, stead, how, how not steadfast they are, right? How they're always not listening to the Prophet Wasallam and always making excuses for things. That's the primary, these are the three uh, primary themes of this surah. But first, I'm going to tell you about this treaty of Sulah Hudaybiyah. <clears throat> because linked with the first verse as well. So, this surah, so this whole surah Fatih, it was revealed during a travel. It was revealed during a safar of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, this whole surah was given to him. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when he got this surah, he was very happy and elated. He said that this surah is more dear to me than this world and everything in it. it was very, you know, very special for him. This surah. Um, <clears throat> so basically, what happened is the Battle of Badr, the Battle of Uhud, then the Battle of Ahzab. These are all before Surah Hudaybiyah. The Battle of Ahzab in the fifth Hijri. <coughs> Then in the sixth Hijri, Prophet ﷺ sees a dream. The dream is that he traveled for Umrah. You know, because you have to, you have to imagine what, 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 what's happening in this time in the seerah, right? They've been expelled out of their homeland and these, they're, you know, these mushikeen are um, you know, tr- um, harming them. Although they're expelled, but they're still, uh, their onslaught is continuing at them in Medina, the Munawwara. The Prophet ﷺ all of a sudden sees a dream that he went to done the Umrah. So Prophet said, the Prophet's dreams are revelation. So he saw that as a clear indication that, okay, maybe Allah was wanting us to go to. Although that was something they couldn't even dream of because that's the place where they were persecuted from. Mm-hmm. But they, Prophet saw that this was the dream. This is a revelation. It's a sign that we need to move forward. So 1,500 Sahaba along with him said, let's move forward. Everyone went except the Munafiqin. So what do we learn from that? So even if it's like a hard, in this story, I'm going to tell you this whole story. It's a long story. Um, I'll give you as many as details as I can. But we learn the interaction between the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba. So we get that close up uh, of how, how they were. And we, we realize the, the mindset of a believer and the mindset of a hypocrite. So the, all the believers are, although it's a very, like, it's impossible, mission impossible. The people who persecuted you and now you're going to do, do Umrah in their land. And no munafiqs followed Allah. They said no munafiqs came on board because it wasn't like obligatory. Prophet ﷺ said, I'm going for Umrah. Who's coming along? That's all he said. So all the 1,500 or 400 or 500 Sahaba, they were on board. All the munafiqs, they didn't have to go. It wasn't, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't imposed on them. And they all made excuses except for one munafiq. He came along. Then when he got closer to Makkah, he, he, he let someone know, let the mushikin know that we're coming for Hajj. We don't want them to get any bad messages. That why are they coming? One thousand five hundred all of them together. The rule of the mushikeen was they were they were allowing, despite their fight. It was a type of jahiliya where right? people used to fight for petty reasons, but they were allowing the pilgrims. Some of the mushikeen, the, the Quraysh, they would take pride of the upkeep of of Bakka. So uh, they would allow pilgrims. Even the enemies were allowed pilgrims. So. Prophet sent a message forward to them that we're not coming here to engage in any kind of warfare and have trouble. We're just coming here with our ihram on. We're just going to do our ibadah and leave. So he informed them. 
So when they got to Hudaybiyah, right, that maqam, that has a different name today. I think it's called Shumaysa. Today it's called Shumaysa. Um, they got to that place. This is where this treaty was done. Also, you may have heard the word Sula Hudaybiyah. You might have heard the word Bay'iridwan. You think of Sira, you'd hear these two names. They both are occurred in this event. So the Sula Hudaybiyah and Bay'ar, there's a pledge allegiance that the Sahaba did with Rasulullah and they all took, it all took place here. <clears throat> so when the Mushikin found out that he has reached, they sent a message to him, you can't come. So although and this, so this obviously the Sahaba saw this was so discriminatory, everyone comes, right? Because although they fight all the time, but this was you know, a, holy, a holy journey was always acceptable. <clears throat> so they, they blocked off Rasulullah that he cannot come in. So Usman who was sent as a diplomat to go and talk to them that was going on. They've already traveled this much way and they have the haram on. They're not coming for any other intention. They're just coming to their umrah and they're going to leave. They told Usman who, who said, we ever blocked you, man? I said, because, you know, they, almost Usman was one from one of the rich sahaba. They said, of course, for you, the doors are all open. You do, please do one hajj, do a couple of umrahs. We only saying that Rasulullah can't come. So Usman said, if Prophet can't come, do you think I, I'm interested in doing Hajj over here and Umrah over here? Absolutely not. I'm not here to do Hajj or Umrah if Rasulullah can't come. Also, we learn you know, loyalty here. I said loyalty and their connection. <clears throat> then a rumor was spread. <clears throat> That Uthman was killed. To the, because he hasn't returned yet. A rumor was spread to the Muslims that while he went for dipl diplomatic reasons, the, he was killed. So at that time, if you imagine how disturbed the, the Sahaba and the Prophet must have been. So then the Prophet took allegiance from them. That was called Bayar al In Sira, these two things are very famous. Sulah Hudaybiyah. Again, the story I'm giving you with some details, you can hear it with much more details, a lot of lessons to be learned in it. And the other is Bayar Ridwan. <clears throat> so he took that allegiance. He told them, the Prophet was very upset by that. He said, now we're not leaving until we avenge Uthman radiallahu So that Bayar was that we're gonna, we can, we're not gonna go back. We're, we'd rather die here or we have to take revenge for the blood of, we need re, uh, revenge for the blood of Uthman radiallahu So they all took allegiance to it. Then it came out that that news, that news was false. So Usman safely returned back to the caravans. <clears throat> but this opened up something else. Now the Mushikin heard a rumor. They heard a rumor that, oh, Muslims are saying they're not returning, they're ready to die, they're staying right there. Now they got scared. But overall, they were always scared inside. Them. One of the reasons they didn't want even the Muslims coming close by is because they knew Islam is spreading. And 1,500 strong, along with the Sulaw, so they, they thought that all their leadership was going to be gone. Everybody was just converted just by looking at 1,500 Sahaba and Rasulullah. Their leadership was at question. So when they heard, they heard the other rumor that, oh, they're ready to not leave and they have to die in the process, I think they didn't hear the whole story. Uh, but they're like, oh, let's talk about peace. So then now they sent their diplomat. Okay. Now the diplomats are supposed to sit down and come up with a peace. They don't want him to go for Umrah. Uh, what, what can happen? <clears throat> so they made a peace treaty. This is called Sulah Hudaybiyah, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, 10 year plan. 10 year plan. And these were the conditions that were placed in it. Number one, no war <clears throat> between us, Makkah and Medina. And then Prophet Sallallahu and the Mushrikeen are not going to engage in a war. And number two, if, and, uh, and they put unjust uh, uh, points within the treaty. The second point was that if a Medina man, man or woman, uh, Medina person goes to Mecca, the Meccans don't have to return him. They can keep him if, he, if, if they like. But if a Meccan goes to Medina, then the Medina people have to return him. This was unjust for the Muslims. It, sh it should be equal. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be one-sided. Make sense? So the Sahaba are very disturbed by that. So Rasulullah these Mushikis have been giving us a hard time since the past. Right? What, what um, you know, atrocity have they not done? Even stopping us from Umrah was unjust. Every, these are super unjust, weak people. And if we're going to do peace treaty on this, Prophet said, let it be. Let it be. But they were all Sahaba were very upset, especially Umar at this point. The reason Prophet did that, he wanted to make sure the sanctity of Haram, 
he said that uh, if we don't do peace treaty, then uh, like if we don't agree to these terms, they might they might violate the haram, the the, the hurma of the haram. They might get into an engagement, and in the meantime, and the, the violation of the haram will take place. In the meantime, there was also a man from Mecca who was coming to Medina, came into the caravan of Rasulullah and Prophet returned him back. So when this man came, so the Sahaba said, no, don't return him. He's our guy. He's fleeing the Meccans. He wants to be with us. Don't return him. But because of the peace treaty, Prophet said, we, we, you know, this is our agreement. We're going to send him back. And then a woman came, same similar, like running away from the Meccans to, to be with them in Medina, Medina, Medinans. Prophet said, no, we're going to keep her. And he said, oh, because look, the peace treaty says man. The peace treaty says man. It didn't say woman. So therefore, we're not going to send her back. So like that. So following the law to the T, understand on that contract, letting you know, letting them, you know, agreeing to these weak, um, unjust conditions, but at the same time following the agreement to the T. So Sahaba at this point were all of them were very disturbed. Remember, their own families were destroyed, their relatives were killed. Imagine all, all what has happened to them so far, from Mecca to Medina, to the Battle of Badr, to Uhud, to Khandaq, to imagine, put all that imagination into play, imagine how disturbed they are. They're super disturbed, and especially the top of all, Umar radiallahu ta'ala. No, the only person who was not disturbed was Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala was, was at peace. He said, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is saying it, let's move on. Prophet Sallallahu is saying it, let's move on. I mean, this, there's got to be a lot of wisdom in this. Let's move on, let's move on. Okay, so he was, he was very calm. <clears throat> the third condition they put down in the 10 year contract that uh, no umrah this year you got to go back now although you have your ihram on take it off go, but next year you can come we'll give you three days within a year in those three days you come and you get to do your umrah oh and when you come make sure you don't have any weapons on you if you do make sure they're in their what are you going to call it in their sheath and then make sure no exposed weapon, it should be like a small one, it should be in your sheets. Although, remember, they're the ones who are starters of everything. And remember, you would need defense, you're in such hostile environment, but it said only small weapons and you need to be in your sheets. <clears throat> so these were just some okay, that I've mentioned. These are the contracts, so they all agreed on this. Then Prophet Sallallahu he wanted the Sahaba, told the Sahaba, you've heard, this is the contract you've signed, 10-year deal, done. Now open up your haram. Just get ready to go back. So he noticed that the Sahaba, when he said that, they weren't budging to, they weren't budging to start doing it, whatever he just said. So he became a bit uh, you know, upset because of that. So he went into his camp and he asked his wife, Umm Salama radiallahu ta'ana, that I just asked them to take off the haram. They're just sitting there. So she said that maybe they're sitting there because they're thinking that some revelation is going to come to maybe say that no, it's something else they're supposed to do. So what you do is that you shave your own head. And when the, sahab, when the Sahaba will see that you're, of course, they'll do everything. That, they always do everything that, like the way you do it. And then, and so here we also learned the wisdom of a woman, and then of, the, of the wife. He took that mashwara and he did that. And then the Sahaba followed suit. <clears throat> then on their return home, this is when this whole Surah Fatah is revealed. The Surah we're about to start. This surah was revealed on their return home. Now we understand the context. So we had to go through that whole context in order for you to understand when the surah was revealed. <clears throat> and the Prophet Sallallahu made that statement that this surah is very dear to me. I thought this surah is more dear to me than this world and whatever it contains. I thought this was very personal for him. He loved this surah much. <clears throat> so ready everyone? First verse. Inna fatahna laka fatham. Mubina. The verily we have um, we have granted you an open victory. We have granted you a open victory. <clears throat> so when this verse was revealed, when the Sahaba come found out this verse was revealed, they thought, what victory? This victory? <laughs> they get it like that. What victory? This victory. So Rasulullah knew that, that this was a victory. Um, 
So some saw, some there's different tafsirs of this. Which victory is it talking about? Some say this was a prophecy of Fatay Makkah that will occur. Also, this was just the start of the fall of the Makkah. This was the start. After this, it was all Fudhuhat. It was all victories after this. Like three months later, Khaybar was uh, conquered. All the conquering take, took place. Remember, this is sixth Hijri. And by eighth Hijri, the Makkah is uh, the conquest of Makkah takes place, right? 10,000 Sahaba strong go in, no bloodshed is. No fight, it's just the keys are just handed over of the whole city. So what do we learn from that? Everyone? We learned that sometime in life, it looks like you, when you take the, you know, you take the bad angle, you take the lower position, Allah's with us plans maybe, super, that lower position might be your, your winning move. Yes, that humbling, that, that lowering position might be the one, the means of your, your upliftment. Everyone understands that lesson? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Prophet was inspired. And then, so Sahaba were very disturbed, but on the way back, they started feeling a lot of sukun. They completely understood. Like even for them, like how Prophet understood from the very, very beginning. Also Prophet understood when he was in Sulah Hudaybiyah, his, his camel was usually a camel that moves forward really fast. His, his camel won't move forward. Prophet knew that it's time to sign this peace treaty and go back. Because he always knew his camel to always move forward. Like, and they were very hasty. So on the way back, um, they had a lot of spoon in their heart. They all understood that this was something that Allah was pleased with. It's part of his plan. And, you know, and then this verse in the Fatah. So in the Fatah, like a Fatah Mubina, could be a reference to Surah Hudaybiyah itself is a victory. Why? Because it's the start of the fall of the Mushrikeen. Then all the events that take place afterward, they're all victories. Until the final victory that they the, take, the, take the whole Makkah without even a, um, picking up a sword. <clears throat> Then the next verse, Allah Subhanahu here mentions gifts to Rasulullah after that. That, oh Prophet, we have given you this great victory. Then, and then I'm now pointing out some of the gifts of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so that he may forgive you and he has forgiven you your past and future sins. Talk about Rasulullah It said we are using the word dumb, literal translation, sin. Obviously, anbiya are far from sin. It means a mistake, a slip. That we have forgiven any of your slips, uh, past or present, the ones that you have not even done in the future. And then this was his, his gift. That of course, you're someone's really great to us. And then this is nothing. You signed a, you know, a, 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 an outwardly contract that looks like that you have the weekend. This is nothing. We have forgiven all your past and future sins. And we have completed our, uh, he has completed his favor upon you. This could mean his favor, meaning the Islam, deen of Islam is now being fully given to you. It's about to, he has completed it. Your favor of Islam has been given to you um, at this point also upon the believers. And, and we have guided you to the straight path. And gift number four, nasran aziza, And we have given you strong assistance. These are the four gifts. So by the time the Sahaba read this, that okay, Prophet is getting all these gifts. Where's our gifts? So then next, the verses, they start talking about his gifts, the Sahaba's gifts. So the next verses are about the Sahaba's gift. He is the one, Anzala Sakina, he is the one who brought down Sakina, in the hearts of the believers. That was their gift. That means they started to understand all this on the way back. That what would just happen there might be, it's actually a great victory. So the Sakina comes down. Later on, it also mentions, That their iman was increased. Just by the whole event, their iman was their iman was already high. Sahaba Ikram's iman, right? It shoots up right after being in the company of Rasulullah, but increased even more with the Surah Hudaybi. That was their second gift. And number three, the, the bay'ah, Ridwan. Um, Allah SWT, they got the bay'ah. That's why it's called Ridwan. It's the one that bay'ah that the Prophet said, take this bay'ah with me. And they said, we're going to take this bay'ah. Because they did it, that's what the reason it's called Ridwan. They got their title. From it. So they were given the glad tiding that you are Jinnatis. You know, that's part of our belief. All the difference between the prophets, prophets are Jinnati, and they're masoom, they're sinless in the world. The Sahaba Ikram, our belief about them is that they're all Jinnati, they're all going to paradise. Although they're human, they may have made an error, but they have, all, have sought forgiveness. Or either case, Allah is 
pleased with them, they're going to Jannah. That's the third, that was their gift. But in the world, they were given this, uh, this, this information that you are, or you, you're going to go to Jannah. Mm. Allah is pleased with you. <clears throat> <clears throat> then moving on so it says Sakina fi mu'minin, that the Sakina was put into the hearts of the believers and this increased their iman along with the iman that they already had and to Allah belong the armies of the heavens and the earth so what does this mean that Allah to Allah belongs the armies of the heavens and the earth one is that you can say of course everything is the army of Allah if you're against Allah everything is the creation and and the power and the pudra of Allah. If you're against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everything is against you. That everything is his creation and in the servitude to him. But some other ulama have done tafsir of this verse like this. That, that the armies of the heavens and the earth. Armies of the heavens means angels. And the earth means sahaba. Or you can replace the word sahaba and say believers. That when these two combine. And, and then this is a mighty force. Then no, no, no uh, army in the world could ever defeat this army. If these two are combined, the heavens and the earth, if there's ever believers and the angels, just like in Badr we saw, right? In Badr, the, the believers were there and the malaika came down and they defeated. So some say this verse is a reference to that. Wallahi jinudu samawati wa rab wa kan Allahu alim al hakima. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ever knowledgeable and ever wise. Yudhil al mu'mina wal mu'minat. This is ayah number five. And so that he may enter the believing men and the believing women into gardens, into paradise. Tajrib uh, in anhar Paradise which rivers flow beneath them. <coughs> and they will remain there forever. Where you kafir on him, say yadim, and he will expiate for them their sins. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ عَنْدَ اللَّهِ فَوْزًا عَظِيمًا And this with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is great success. That they're going to also have forgiveness. These believing men and believing women, these uh, Sahaba Ikram, they're going to have uh, forgiveness from Allah SWT and they'll go to Jannah and whatever faults that they have, they're human beings, Allah SWT will expiate. Then the next verse, verse number six. Wal wal and he will punish the hypocrite men and the hypocrite women and the mushikin men and the mushikin uh, Women. Those who had bad thoughts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's talking about they're, they're going to have adab, the munafiqin and the mushrikeen. Now in this scenario, in the Sulah Hudaybiyah story, what, what was the bad thought that is being referred to here of the munafiqs and the mushrikeen? The, the, mushrik, the munafiqin's bad thought was, that, oh, the, they, they were fearing death. But oh, if we go with Rasulullah then we're going we're gonna to end up dying. So this was their bad thought about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's saying that these bad, this bad thought destroyed them. What was the bad thought of the mushriks? The mushriks, they realized they always used to allow people, even the enemies, to come and do umrah. But they thought that, oh no, if Prophet gets here, then their leadership, their leadership is at question. That's an all their, um, you know, whatever they have made up so far, it's all going to disappear. So it was that their leadership was at question. So that was their bad thought. So Allah SWT says that we will give them azab because of these bad thoughts. And alihim da'ira to so upon them, their vice, their, the, 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 their vices will uh, encapsulate them. وَغَضِبُ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ Allah SWT is angry with them. وَلَعَنَهُمْ And his curse is upon them. وَعَدَّ لَهُمْ جَهَنَّمْ And prepared for them جَهَنَّمْ وَسَاءَتْ مَسِيرَ And it is an evil destination. So it's talking about where the munafiq and mushikin end up. Allahumma fazna Next, وَلِلَّهِ جُنُودُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ So this verse is repeated. To Allah belongs the armies of the heavens and the earth. And I've already explained what's the armies of the heavens and the earth. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ عَزِيزًا حَكِيمًا And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ever powerful, ever wise. Then the next verse. إِنَّا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ شَاهِدًا وَمُبَشِّرًا وَنَزِيرًا Verily we, um, we have sent you, O Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, shahidan, as a shahid, as a witness. Right? We have many verses that talk about Rasulullah Sallam being a witness. Right? He's a witness. Every Nabi is the first witness for his Ummah. He has delivered the message. Then there's other witnesses as well. But he's the primary witness. Also, another meaning of Shahid, and so this attribute of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that he's a Mu'allim, a teacher. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's role primarily is to teach the deen of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And number, another meaning of Shahid is Adil. He's just. 
is a witness has to be just. So we have sent you this justice, Rasulullah Sallallahu And a person who gives good news and who gives warning. The role of Rasulullah Sallallahu is justice, to show you the justice, teach you the justice, and also give you the good news in life, and also give you all the warnings that you ever need. It's all provided by him. Three, three things. Three attributes of Rasulullah Sallallahu Then these three attributes, the next, there's four attributes that the Sahaba Ikram had towards him. Like, or Sahaba Ikram had, and that me and you should have. Sahaba Ikram had them, and me and you should have them. That we have a Nabi who's, who's, who's showing you justice, giving you all the good news, giving you all the warnings that you ever need. And now you need to reciprocate that with your five things. Now, what are those five things that we're supposed to do back? The next verse. Number one is that you all believe in Allah and His Rasul. Okay, since we've given you such a clear messenger, uh, such a great messenger, now you all should believe in Allah and His Rasul. You should all support him. Strengthen him. And you should all honor him. And you should do tasbih of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, bukatan wasila, morning and evening. When it says you should strengthen him, that pronoun at the end, him, some say this refers back to Prophet Islam and some say it refers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can do it both ways. If you do it, Rasulullah, you do it like this that you all believers strengthen him, Rasulullah, you all honor him. And then the last one, you do tasbih of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's how you do that. Or you can do the pronouns like this that you fit them all to. You fit all the pronouns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You say, you strengthen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because look, strengthening the Prophet is like strengthening Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Strengthening Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's cause is like strengthening. Basically, it refers to the, to the cause of the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you all strengthen it, meaning the, uh, or you can just say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which means the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What to waqiru, you honor Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What to sabbihu, and you all do the speech of him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, bukatan wa asi. We're going to do all this. This is our, our job to do. We have to believe. We have to strengthen um, the, Allah, the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to respect the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you have to do tasbih of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bukratan wasi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give tawfiq. And then the final verse for today's dars. Inna alladheena yubayi'oonak. And this verse is a praise for the sahaba. Okay, another, as I said, this surah to today is filled with the praise of the sahaba. Right, who were with Rasulullah and Sulaiman Davia, and the Munafiqin were not uh, behaving. Inna ladina yubayyirunak. Verily, those who did bear to you, O Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Inna ma yubayyiruna Allah. Verily, they did bear with Allah subhanahu wa taala. Whoever put their, whoever took took allegiance with you, literally took allegiance with Allah subhanahu wa taala. Yadullahi fauqa idhim. Allah subhanahu wa taala's hand was above their hand, meaning that when Prophet Sallam's hand was there. And then they put their hands on top. So you have to imagine that on top of that was the hands of Allah. So of course, Allah is uh, free from hands and these types of things. So this is just metaphorical. Um, but meaning that it was just like that. And also we remember, we can learn from this that when we follow the sunnah of Rasulullah and said when we follow the way of Rasulullah it's the only way that's pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Obedience to Allah, Prophet Sallallahu is like obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What other way is there? Then it says, فَمَنْ نَكَثَ فَإِنَّمَا يَنْكُثُ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ That whoever breaks this covenant. We could take this general or we could take this specific. If we think of it as specific to this case, that, oh, Sahaba, you took this bear, and if you were to break it, then you're harming yourself. Or we could take it general, like for me and you. We have all taken bear with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, we've taken some allegiance with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we say, La ilaha illallah wa rasulullah. Bay'ah means allegiance, right? We have an allegiance with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is if you break it, it goes against your self. And then after that, it says, Woman, ofa alayhi Allah. But if you are to fulfill this allegiance that you have taken with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَسَيُؤْتِيهِ أَجْرًا عَظِيمًا Then he will grant you a great reward. Now you can take this as a, you can take it as specific, or you can take it general. Specific would mean that, oh, Sahaba, if you fulfill this, your allegiance with Rasulullah we're going to give you a great reward. General, general meaning, it can include us, that our allegiances to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we were to fulfill them, then he will grant us a great reward now here we're just going to have a little just something about bayan <clears throat> the word bayan it also means sale because it comes from the root word in arabic bayan means selling so when you do bayan you're like you're selling yourself off but that's what allegiance that's what a contract is isn't it 
Like when you sign a contract, you're signing that you know, this much time of yours is owed to this office. That's a bayah. Every contract, you know, how many of us sign contracts? Sign contracts all the time. Those are all what? We're not using the word bayah, but it's really what? It's a bayah. Okay. Also remember that فَاسْتَبْشِرُوا An ayah of the Quran says فَاسْتَبْشِرُوا بِبَيْعِكُمُ الَّذِي بَيَعْتُمْ بِهِ that you should be, you should rejoice for the bayah that you have taken. All Muslims have taken an allegiance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should rejoice that we have taken such an allegiance. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says elsewhere in the Quran, Inna Allah ashtara, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has purchased from the believers their nafs and their wealth for the price that you can have paradise. So you already, your allegiance means that you're sold. Your money is sold and your body is sold. And the price is what? Jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant you. So allegiance always means selling something off. Now, how many types of allegiance are there in Islam? There could be various types of allegiance. Sometimes they're obligatory, sometimes they're fard, sometimes they're wajib, sometimes they're mustahab. At different levels, you can find out what kind of bay'ah is what for you at what time. So there's, for example, bay'ah al-Islam. You know, you know, when someone takes shahada, when you make someone take shahada, that's a bay'ah. You know, we never think of it like that. But it's, uh, he's taking bay'ah at your hands. Um, it's, it's an allegiance. It's an allegiance. Bay'ah al-jihad, when there's warfare, there's bay'ah taken, you will, you, will, you will be there in a steadfast way. Bay'ah al-khilafa, this is pledge allegiance to the, to the government. Right? Al-khilafa, whoever is the khalifa. And bay'ah al-makhsus al-amal, specific acts. People, there could be a bay'ah for particular acts. These are like things that are known within sharia or that have been done. And then there's bay'ah al-ita'ah. You take uh, bay'ah on the hands of a pious person that, uh, that you'll obey him. He'll, he'll give you his training so that he makes you a better person. Tarbiyah, nurturing. So you take bay'ah at the hands of a pious person, right, with the shuyukh. And what, what the purpose of that is what? The purpose of that is that you're, you're, se you're selling, you're, like, islah, like you're going to listen to him. You're not going to become offended that if he's going to point things out to you. And uh, he's going to try to help you to the best of it. And obviously that should be done with somebody who's a very good person. And then he shouldn't be, he should be somebody right, following the sunnah of Rasulullah Actually, I have some list here. So the person who you can take bay'ah for islah should be a person who has ilm. Number one, he should have ilm, adequate knowledge of Quran and sunnah. If he's short on knowledge of Quran and sunnah, how is he going to make you a better person? Number one. Number two, it shouldn't be known about him that he does major sins. That you don't know that from him, that he's committing major sins or he's persistent on small sins. Because if he's doing that, then how is he about to help you out? So you, then if you do it, this is called bayah. It's also known as bayatul ita'ah. It's also known as bayatul islah. Right? This is uh, mustahab. Just to give you the level on that one. This is recommended. So these were a few things. These are some discussion about bayah. These are the few verses that we've started about Sulah Hudaybiyah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a true understanding of it. Wa akhir da'wana alhamdulillah bil alameen. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanallah wa azim. Inshallah, if there's any questions, we can take it. Or, and then we'll make zikr. And then we'll make dua, inshallah. Same about that. Uh, from, so from this verse that they're, um, there's a verse as well. Yeah, there's, there's a verse, verse as well. So maybe the, this came before the verse. Um, I'm not sure how it's connected to the word, but there's a verse. If you buy your own, get a hat of shedderati for Alima Mafi, who will be him for Anzala Sakina to Alim, who are the one for Tan Kariba. That's the verse. Allah has become pleased with the believers when they did bear with you, O Prophet Shajar, under the tree. And he knew that which is in their hearts. So he bestowed his sakina upon them and he gave them a soon victory. Oh, that's different. Yeah. Oh, when did they actually first get the title of Ridwan? Yeah. I'm not sure. Well, okay, I, I see what you're saying. You're asking that was it from Sulah Hudaybiyah and this Bayat did it one that they yeah. got this, or was there ever a verse before or something? Yeah, because do they know that they called Bayat is one based on this, or they, you're calling Bayat is one because they know that under the verses, 
that you know where it allows review the worship that I'm doing with you and the with them. So I'm just wondering like is this where they're actually the promise of us uh I thought it was this one, but I'll double check. Let me let me double check that's that. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that no when they did that bear, that's why it's called bear that it won. And they got the title from here, but I maybe we could look more into that. So that is the name of one. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, mm -hmm. Couple of I think two, two, three places where they mention that. Anything else? Yes. I mean that was it. That was the first. I mean Bayina before sort of that, right? Surah Fat? Yeah. No, the one we're doing? Huh? The Surah Bayina is at the end, Surah uh, Juz no. 30. Oh, yeah, no, I'm talking about the title of this revelation. Surah Fat? Yeah. Oh. No, I mean, that was Bayina, wasn't that before? Surah Fat? Before Fat. Uh, I'm going to have to look into that. Yeah, we did another, another Surah when I was over there. Okay, okay. Uh, you know, where this, this came? This came. Well, this. This prayer didn't come like, you know. Okay. Yeah. But remember, the Quran is not in this order, right? It could have been that those verses came after this yeah. verse. And then I'm not sure where Surah Bayina comes in. All that would have to be checked. Mm -hmm. As far as time, my question was, was, was this the point where they found out because now that they're so loyal? And then in the future, Allah is going to say, you know. It's good. I, I'm, let, me, let me look into that. I'm not sure. It's, it seemed like it, but let's, yeah. let's let's look more into it. Let's see maybe. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, we'll make the dhikr now. So we read certain ayat, Hasbunallah wa Nam al Wakil. And then when I read them, then you all read it seven times. La hawla wa it's called Khatmi Khajkan. Um we'll read that and then after that we'll do zikr of Dayah Allah. We'll do Muraqaba basically. We'll do muraqaba, where you close your eyes and then and you you um, you you imagine that Allah, your heart is saying Allah. Okay, just close your eyes and you do that. You just close your tongue and you do it. If you're having a hard time, if your thoughts are here and there, then you can just do Allah, Allah a little bit just to get you a bit realizing that your heart is saying it. And then after that, is imagine that your heart is saying, La ilaha illallah. Do that same zikr that you do already, La ilaha illallah and Allah. The only difference is instead of with the tongue, it's allow the heart to do it. Yeah. This practice, when you do it, the gift of it is that you will be in a, you'll practicing this is that now you'll be able to, whenever you're walking here and there, you'll, 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 your heart will constantly keep saying Allah, Allah. It is this muraqaba is the training to do that. Because Rasulullah was always in a state of dhikr. So how is that possible? Um, so this is something that the ulama, this is one method of doing dhikr. And when you do that, it has lots of muraqaba, has so many benefits. Mm. And amongst them is one that I've shared with you that you will get the ability that you will always keep Allah subhanahu in the back of your mind. So, inshallah, in a few minutes, let's do the question. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Mawlana Muhammad wa ala wa ala ala Sayyidina Mawlana Muhammad wa barik wa sallam. Hasbunallahu wa ni'mal wakil.